What a race then with the eight hours bar rate. I was lucky to be able to sit down and watch through it today live. And I watched probably about six hours of it um, in total, which included going to, um, say, going out of the house, not following it necessarily on my phone, and um, doing a live stream. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised I was able to keep up with so much of it, but let's run through it. I'm going to go through the hypercars, then the GT3s, and we'll look at the respective champions. And then I'll give some concluding remarks, yeah? And we'll start off with Hypercar because, well, Toyota were at the front. They locked out the front row. And it looked like you could possibly see the 7 running away and taking the title. Especially given how so quickly into it we saw the 6 being turned off the track. Uh, getting tapped and going off at turn 4. Then you saw the issues for the 50 and you're like, oh... Why do I actually do the double here? And then the seventh fuel pump went. Nick DeVries was in the car at the time. And he was like, oh, <laughs> this is way back in Porsche's field. This is Porsche's to lose. Little did we know what was going to happen in the remainder of the race. Little did we know that the eight, who had been turned around when they were going through to lap cars for the first time by the, uh, I think it was number 82, wasn't it? They ended up finishing third. Might have been the 81, it was one of the Corvettes. Ended up not only setting the fastest lap of the race by, what, nearly a second, but charging back through, having two pit stops more than the second place 51 Ferrari, pit stop more than the number five Porsche that was in second, to win and to take the championship for Toyota by two points. I think it was two points in the end, thanks to the 51 getting past the 5 on the final lap. Honestly, really well done by them. It was a brilliant drive by Buemi, aided by the fact that even though they'd been on the wrong tyres for multiple different phases of the race, being on the hards when it was hot, being on the mediums when it was cold, when it all counted at the last moment, they were on better tyres than the 5. And... In the eternal conditions of cautions breeding cautions, mostly for the LMGT3 field, they were able to make the most of it. There was other bad luck in the um, hypercar field. Obviously, uh, the 20 didn't finish. 94 had to pull over to a stop. I didn't actually catch the 63 retiring again. Um, he retired with, what, only... Just over an hour left, I guess. But, yeah, it had all kinds of different stories. I mean, the top seven were seven different manufacturers. And yes, there were safety cars. But in the end, they weren't separated by much. They were separated by a minute or less than a minute after eight hours. And all seven being seven different manufacturers shows how good a field it's been. In LM GT3, and it was another win for Ferraris, another win for the Vista AF Corsa. It's a 55 that took the win from the two TF Sport entries. Charlie Eastwood bringing the 81 across the line. Um, they were saying on the broadcast um, in the week that he sadly lost his father. And then the 82 coming across the line afterwards with Danny and Cadella behind the wheel at the end. And th this was a class that was full of drama as well. It was a nightmare one for Toyota Group because in addition to the 7, both the 87 and 78 Akodis ASP Lexus cars retired with different issues. And the issues they had were just astounding. I mean, you had the suspension, you had the engines go. The engines went at the same point in the track, roughly, for both of the Proton Competition Mustangs. And you just can't make that up i mean there were only four retirements in lmgt3 but all four of them were just from two teams the two akasps and the two protons i think it was in the end one of the most retirement heavy races of the season i mean barring Le Mans, because we had eight retirements from an entry list of 36 but 
like I said, it was a fun watch, and there were battles all the way through to the end. There were clashes all the way through to the end. Augusto Farfus picking up a, was it a drive-through penalty at the end of it all, um, as a result of collision with the heart of racing Aston in I think it's their last race, isn't it? Um, because they're stepping up to be the hypercar entry next season for Aston Martin with Valkyrie. And let's look back on that season. Now, obviously, like I've said, um, I didn't watch the season in full. I watched Le Mans. I watched um, bits of Imola. I watched Fuji. And I watched this one live. It's been a great season. Endurance racing is at its strongest that it's been in probably 30 or 40 years. And we can thank the hypercar formula. The LMH and LMDH. I mean, it's quite telling in that you can have a mix of the LMHs and LMDHs battling out for the title. Porsche is an LMDH. Ferrari and Toyota are LMHs. Um, what else do we have that's in there? The Alpine is an LMDH. Uh, the Peugeot is an LMH. Uh, the BMW is an LMDH. The Caddy is an LMDH. And I believe the Lamborghini is as well, isn't it? We have pretty much, especially with Aston Martin coming in next season, an even split between the LMH and LMDH cars, and that is something that's great for that championship. In addition to that, we have a great variety of entries in the LMGT3 field, though still surprisingly, for what we've got, we don't have um, Mercedes, for instance, who you would expect to see in a GT3 championship competing here. Please put the um, AMG Project One or its uh, successor into hypercar, and then we can have uh, we can have it as well. I would love to see like fifty entries in two different classes for uh, for WEC. That that would be monstrous. It would be amazing. Um, it would be a lot of fun to follow along with, because this is pretty much a golden era. I don't like the idea, like I said in the Fuji one, that we deliberately make them slower so that uh, F1 is still the fastest. I like the idea of them being cheaper. Like, the LMDH formula is great, and we're going to have Genesis coming in in LMDH as well, which will be brilliant to see. But I don't want it to be that we have to have F1 as the pinnacle. I want these to all be separate, different pinnacles, because, look, Nick De Vries has been great in endurance racing, as he has been in Formula E, but he wasn't cut out for F1. Andre Lotterer has now won two different titles for two different manufacturers at the end of his second season with Porsche. But if you judged him by the one F1 rating out of a Caterham, you probably wouldn't think that highly of him. But this has been great to see. I'm not just biased because one of my friends made it onto the broadcast for his work with his team. But uh, it's, it's just fun. I just wish that it was easier to access. Um... I've complained before about the Rally TV app, which now finally has volume controls. Um, the app on the phone for um, WEC TV, uh, it doesn't do picture in picture on Android, which is strange. So I had to have the app fully open or not be watching at all when I was out. Now, granted, that meant that I was actually, you know, engaging with the real world, but that's besides the point. Um, yeah, the, the online player is good. But I would love for it, and this is more a complaint about Formula E, and a complaint about different streaming services. You can get WEC and Formula E on Discovery, but you have to get the £30 a month one, which is a ridiculous cost to pay just to watch Formula E. No, I'm sorry, that is a bit of a rant. Um, again, it's not something that's necessarily to do with WEC. It's great that you can watch WEC in two different places, though. And I wish F1 had that. So I didn't have to pay for a Now TV or Sky Sports subscription so that I could watch F1. Because I have an F1 TV subscription, which is great because it means I can go back through the repository. I can go and look through the history of Formula 1. But you can't watch the live stuff. The live timing is good. And you get that in the F1 membership. And granted, the F1 TV membership in the UK is slightly cheaper than in the rest of Europe. But I want a lot more of this stuff to happen in-house or regularly. Is that too much to ask? 
Let me know your thoughts and everything else in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching and joining, and I hope to see you again soon. I'm planning on following all of WEC next season. I might do some stuff with Le Mans Autobot on the channel in the meantime. Until then, it's bye-bye for now.